Amen. Morning. How's it going? Is it good? Everyone doing all right? Good? Everyone staying warm? Yeah? Everyone staying warm? We're good? It's getting cold, right? Uh, so a couple years ago in the winter when it started getting cold, uh, I don't know if y'all know this, we live, like our house, mine and JT's house, is which is the church's house that we live in, is like right over here. Uh, and a couple years ago when we were living there, before he got there, it was like Brian and Hunter were still there. Uh, it was winter time, starts getting colder, and we started dealing, we, had a, we started having this uh, rat problem. Anyone ever had a rat problem? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay, really? Yeah, there we go. I was about to say, am I the only one that has rat problem? Okay, so rat problem in the house. And so we're watching a movie one day, and we're just, it was just normal. Everything was peaceful. It was great. All of a sudden, we hear some noise going on in the kitchen. So we go in there, and there's a, there's a, we see the rat scurry across the floor. So we're like, uh-uh, that's not going to happen. So we come over here, and we find upstairs in one of the mini rooms. We just start searching through stuff, and we find this big box of mouse traps. okay? Uh, and I mean, it's just full. I don't know why a church has a box that big of all these mouse traps, but we have it. So if you need that, we have it. Um, and so we go. We go over to the church, or over to the house, back over to the house, put the traps down in the kitchen. Uh, and then we go back to watching the movie. And then like five minutes later, it's like you hear the snap, and it's like, oh, we got it. So we go in there. We see the dead rat. We're like, victory is ours. This is it. And that's, we thought that was the end of it. A little bit we know that was just the beginning of a tremendous rat infestation of our house. And like just day after day, these rats are coming in and it's just, it's killing us. And so it's, uh, and so we're getting, and I, I keep saying we, like I had any involvement in this. I, don't, I didn't really do a whole lot with the whole rat thing because of gross. Um, and so, uh, so we have these rats coming in, just going crazy. And so Hunter's thing was he had a dog at the time. And his dog food, there's a big bag of dog food he leave in the kitchen, which is essentially just free food for the rats. And so they're getting into that. And so they start exploring a little bit more, like, oh, we got that. So now they start going into the bread. They start getting everything else. And then we start seeing, like, rat trails and poop all over the couch. And so they're getting everywhere now. So this affecting everything in the house now. And I came back uh, from... Thanksgiving break with my family, and I have this this gold chair in my room. This is like my favorite chair. It's super comfortable. It's what I watch TV in. And I walk into my room, and I see like this stuffing just laying all over the floor, and they had chewed this giant hole in the side of my chair, and were apparently just living in there while I was gone, and I just, and then, so now it's personal, right? So now it's like, okay, you, you messed with my stuff now, and so it's, it's just an all-out war uh, trying to get rid of these stinking rats because they've, they've been coming in and we thought we found the hole. We thought we took care of the hole. We thought that was it. And it was, they're still somehow coming in. And so as long as, and so until we can get to the source of the problem, until we can get to the source of how they're getting in, they're just going to keep coming in and ruining everything and everyone's chairs and furniture and making us miserable. It's just going to affect everything until we can get rid of this problem, right? And so we have this problem in our lives. Every human being carries a problem, and this problem is called selfishness. Okay? Every one of us has this. You can be like, I'm not very selfish. Yes, you are. We are all selfish human beings. That's just in our nature. We are selfish, prideful people. And the thing about that is it's a problem. Okay? Everyone say, it's a problem. It's a problem, and it affects everything in our lives. This problem of selfishness and pride, um, and, it, and it's, it affects everything. And until we get to the source of the problem, until we get, until we deal with this problem at the source, it's going to continue to come in and affect everything in our lives, every relationship, every aspect of our lives. It's going to be affecting that. And so we're, we're going to look at today. We're going to look at the source of the problem. We're going to look at the severity of the problem, how that affects everything, and then we're going to look at the solution of the problem. Go to James chapter 4. Okay, this is where we're going to be today. We're just going to camp out here in James chapter 4. All right, so just some context of what's going on with with James here. He's finishing up chapter 3, and James is one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love the book of James. Uh, And as I was studying, I saw something that said that the book of James is like a manual for Christian living. I think that's a great way to summarize the book of James. And so James, uh, he, he talks about, at the end of chapter 3, two types of wisdom that people are living off of, that people are living their lives based on. And, and, and he talks about this godly wisdom that you should be obtaining. Uh, that's the first kind, is this godly wisdom. This is wisdom he characterizes by being pure and peace-loving, gentle, merciful, fruitful, uh, char- characterizing that kind of godly wisdom that we should all be striving for and, and obtaining in life and allowing God to be the one guiding our lives and having that kind of wisdom. But he also brings up 
another kind of wisdom, and he calls it earthly wisdom and goes on to say demonic wisdom, okay? And this kind of wisdom is characterized by selfish ambition and envy, okay? And so that sets up where we're picking up here in chapter 4 of where we're at. And so if you're with me, James chapter 4, I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, and we're just going to start right off here looking at the source of the problem. Look at verse 1. He says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Okay, and so he addresses this at the, so he starts off, he says, so we have a problem here in verse 1. We have a problem, and he says there's, there's wars, there's fights, there's all this stuff going on, and he asks, what's the source of the problem? What is causing this problem? And he addresses it in the next part. He says, it's your passions. All right, y'all ready to learn some Greek today? Y'all ready? I'll, I'll try to, I'm not, I didn't take Greek, but I study for it. So uh, the word that's used there for passion is hedone. Everyone say hedone. I think that's good enough. John can correct me later. But that's what the word is. It's, it's used hedone there, the, the Greek word for passions. It's defined by pleasure and lust. It's defined by gratification of the desires of the, fu- the, of the flesh. Essentially, your selfish desires. And he says, you want to know what the source of the problem is? What this problem that we're having, you want to know what the source is? It's your selfishness. It's your selfish desires that you have, these fleshly desires. If you want to turn to 1 John 2 real quick. Uh, First John talks about, in chapter 2, verse 16, he talks about that the things of the world or the, the things that the world is feeding us is, is a reflection of these desires, these sinful desires. And he puts these sinful desires in like three categories. He says it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's lifestyle. Those are the three characteristics of, of these sinful desires, how these things can be summed up. And if you want to also look back into Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, the very first original sin that took place, uh, you see those characteristics, these sinful desires that are what leads Eve to, to take the fruit. So she looks at, this is Genesis 3, 6. Uh, so it talks about that she saw that the fruit was, was good to look at. She saw it was, so she saw this with her eyes. It's, appe- it's pleased her eyes as something that she saw that looked good. Okay, and this is something that I want because it looks really good. She said it, she saw that it looked good for food. It looked like it was, would nourish her, that it would be satisfy, satisfying for her. So that's dealing with, the, that would satisfy this hunger that she has. And so that looks good. That's the desire of the flesh. And then she, it says that she saw that it was um, obtain, desirable for obtaining wisdom. So there's your pride right there. Is this going to make me awesome? It's going to make me super wise and the wisest person ever. And it's those sinful desires that she had that led her astray to pursue this sin. Right, and so this is the source of the problem. It's all, and all of those things are just feeding this desire of our selfishness. It's what I want. I want what I want, and if I don't get what I want, I'm not going to be happy about it. I'll, it's all about me. It's what's going to make me look better as a person. It's going to what's going to benefit me the most. It's all about me. And he talks about going back to to James four, the last part of verse one. It says that these desires that are present, these, your passions, you also can define it as cravings, these things that, these, this selfishness within you, it says these desires are at war within you. And, and the way that that's written is, is the, at war is that it's used in the present tense. And so that means this is a continuous action that's happening, that it's t- this, this war that's going on. Turn to Galatians 5 real quick. Galatians 5 verse 17. Look at this. And so this is talking about the kind of war that's going on inside of us. Because as a believer, when we, when we give our lives to Christ, when we make Jesus Lord of our lives, we receive the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit is then, his job is to clean out the junk and the mess that doesn't need to be in our lives and to, to provide us with the things and lead us in the way of how we can honor Christ and how we can worship him and serve him faithfully. And so that's what's happening, but... We still are human, and we still have these selfish, this selfish nature within us. And so Galatians 5, Paul says this in verse 17. He says, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So there is that war that's happening. And this is why that war is there is because the desires of the flesh and the desires of the spirit are in complete opposition with each other. You all with me? Okay, and so this is the war that's happening. This is what's causing the problem is this, this selfishness that's, that's in just in the depths of our lives that's at war with the spirit. 
And so if we keep going in, in James 4, looking back in James 4, look at verse 2. And this, now we're going to understand how this, a prob, how this problem affects everything. So we're looking at the severity of the problem, how this affects everything. He's, he's, and it starts off the way that this selfishness starts affecting things at first is it affects us. So let's look at uh, verse 2, looking through verses 2 through 5 real quick. So James says, You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so we're going to stop there. We're going to come back to this. So first, looking at how how this problem affects us personally, is this selfishness produces discontentment. Y'all know discontentment, right? So this selfishness produces discontentment. And you see that through, the, through verse 2. It says, you desire and do not have. You covet and cannot obtain. And so this is, there, you're being left with this, uh, this feeling of discontentment. And discontentment essentially is the result of you not getting what you want. I don't have what I want, and I'm not happy about it. That's where discontentment shows up. And discontentment produces things like a lack of peace. You're just constantly on edge because you don't have what you think you want or what you think you need. Discontentment leads to anger and frustration. Again, you are angry and frustrated because you don't have what you want. And then you also, out of that, have this, this discontentment brings emptiness, this feeling of I'm missing out on something, I'm lacking something. And so this selfishness affects us personally and, and this and how it brings this discontentment. And then that leads us to discontentment with God because God's not dealing with my timing. Um, God's, God's not giving me what I want and so he's not a good God. And so it starts to just affect all of those things. So it produces discontentment, but it also, what we're really going to look at here in verse 2, is how this selfishness affects our relationships with others. Okay, he, he, looking at verse 2 again, it says, You desire and do not have, so you murder. The murder is the result of you not having what you want. And you murdering, or you're murdering somebody else so you can try to get what you want. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight about it. And you, you, you're at war with this. All right, and this is the root of conflict with other people. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I grew up with my older sister. She's two years older than me. All right, anyone has an older older sister, older sibling? Anyone? Y'all with me? Okay. So I had an older, I, I still have an older sister. And when we were kids, she always wanted to play with me. I didn't really want to play with her because I'm an introvert. I like kind of just keeping to myself and playing in my room with my own toys. Um, and but she always wanted to play with me. So being a nice, kind brother that I am, I'm like, absolutely, sure, we can play, whatever. And so she wants to play school. But the thing about playing school is we had two completely different ideas of how we wanted to play school, okay? When she asked me to play school, what she wanted, what her desire was, is she wanted to be the teacher, and I would be the student with all the other stuffed animals, and so she can assign me homework, and I have to do it, and she can grade it, and and send me out in the hallway because I'm being bad or whatever, okay? And so that's her desire. That's how she wants to play school, is she's the teacher, I'm the student. But how I wanted to play was... Okay, we can be like co-teachers, we can be like partners in this, and we can just, just tell the stuffed animals what they're supposed to do and be the teacher there, uh, and be like a vice principal, principal kind of thing. I think that's pretty cool. So that's the way I wanted to play school. And so what do you think happens when we join together to play school? It just brings chaos. It's just, I'm trying to do this one thing, and she's still trying to give me assignments. I'm like, I'm not going to do this because I'm a principal. What are you doing? And so there's just going back and forth, and then we start arguing because we have two completely different ideas of what we want to do here. And then, of course, we start arguing and fighting, and mom comes in, breaks it up. We're grounded for the rest of our lives. And so that's the result of what happens because we both have two completely different desires for how to play school. And that's a goofy illustration, but if, if you really think about it, most of the conflict in our world all around us can be pinpoint, can point all the way back to this, selfishness. Are you all with me? This is where conflict comes from is because two people have two completely different ideas of what they want. And that's where we start seeing fighting because I don't want to relent because I want what I want. And this other person say, no, I want what I want. And you're just going to keep fighting and, and, and being at war and murder and, and all of this stuff going on until you can get what you want. And so this selfishness affects our relationships with others. And let's just talk about the application of this as a church. Because this is something that is a problem in churches all over the place. 
is this issue of selfishness. What divides churches? If you think about the history of, of how churches divide and split up, it's over selfishness. If you really think about it, a lot of the times it's because I have my own way of wanting to do things. We're not singing the songs I want to sing. I'm not hearing the messages I want to hear. There's not enough coffee there to, to feed me and, and, and donuts and all that stuff in Bible study. There's not this, there's not that. And things aren't the way that you want it to be. And when that happens, you, you, you're holding on to your pride because you don't get what you want. That's where we start to see this conflict arise. And, and that's where we have division and disunity. And what we're talking about as, as a church in this time right now, we're at a very important time of this church. We, we talked about this, this whole side of the building over here has to go away. And we, we know that God has led us in this direction. We know he, is, he has given us this task. That this is something that we need to do in obedience but there, if we're going to hold on to our pride and say, you know what, I don't want to move that building. I think it's totally fine. That's too much work. I like things the way they are. If you're going to hold on to that pride, you know what's going to happen? Division, disunity, and how on earth can we expect God to bless that? Think of the other thing is when the Hispanic church is coming over. They're going to be, they've been so awesome over there and they've grown out of that building. So where now we can share this, this building with them. And, and so when they start moving over here in January, what's going to happen is some things are going to change a little bit. Things are not going to be the way they always are. Th- little things are going to change. And if you're going to hold on to your pride, say, whoa, like some of y'all probably just did that. We're like, what are you saying, Kyle? It says, something's going to change. What? And so you get that kind of attitude of like, I don't want anything to change. I like things the way they are. And as long as you hold on to that pride and that selfishness of this is what I want. This is what Robin Wood is all about me. It's my church. This is just going to cause conflict and division. And again, how can we expect God to bless this church if we're living in division and disunity and conflict with one another? So selfishness affects us personally. It also affects our relationships with others. But most importantly, it affects our relationship with God. Look at the last part of verse 2. And so he addresses how this selfishness is affecting the relationship with God here. He starts off in verse 2 saying, or at the last part of verse 2, He says, you do not have because you do not ask. And so he addresses, James addresses a problem here. He says, you don't have because you don't ask. And if you're not asking, that's that's showing, it's revealing that there is a lack of seeking God. So you don't have because you're not seeking God. You're not spending the time to seek after God. And so that selfishness prevents us from seeking God because we have all we need. Why do I need to ask God for anything? I've got all I need, right? It's all about me. And so when you stop seeking God, it's a result of that selfishness. But he goes on to say in verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. And so now we're dealing with, so maybe you are coming to God, maybe you are seeking God, but you're seeking with the wrong motives. You're asking, and he goes on to say at the last part of verse 3, this is what you're asking for. You're asking God for things so that you can spend it on your passions, which is the problem, right? And so now there's this issue of this selfishness is probing us to seek God with the wrong motives. We're asking God for things and we're getting mad because God's not blessing us and giving us what we think we want because those desires that we have that we're asking God for is, is, is all about what's going to help me get what I want, okay? But selfishness also points us to an adulterous friendship. Look at verse 4. He says, you adulterous people... Okay, and so just stopping there, that's a very bold, I mean, he's just calling them out here. He calls them adulterers, all right? And so adultery is being referred to, Old Testament, it's one of the Ten Commandments, don't commit adultery, and you hear that word. But essentially what that is, is you have two people, you have a man and a wife who come together and make a commitment in marriage. And that commitment in marriage is that they are going to be faithful to one another. Are you all with me? That's what the commitment in marriage is, is I'm going to be faithful to you, you will be faithful to me. And then where adultery comes in, by definition, adultery is defined by unlawful intercourse with the spouse of another. And so you are breaking that commitment. You are becoming unfaithful to your spouse by pursuing a relationship with someone who is not your spouse. Are you all with me? And so that's, that's the picture. That's what adultery is. And so he calls them adulterers. He says, you adulterous people. And this is where we get into the application with, with our relationship with God is because when we come into a relationship with God, we are committing, saying, God, I'm going to be faithful to you. you. I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to make this commitment to follow you, to love you, and to worship you and you alone. That's that commitment you're making to God. And when you pursue anything else, you start pursuing the world and the things of the world, which we'll talk about in a second. You're becoming unfaithful to that relationship. So he talks about, he says, you can't, he says, you, are, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God or hostility with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself a what? 
What does that say? An enemy of God. Does that sound like a good thing? Does that sound like, you know what? I want to be an enemy of God. That sounds fantastic. No, it doesn't. That's terrible, right? But this is what he says. How you become an enemy of God is by becoming a friend of the world. All right, and we talked about friendship Wednesday night with our youth and, and just the, the power and the influence that comes with friendship. And the whole thing about friendship, if you've heard this phrase that you are who your friends are. Have you heard that before? You are who your friends are. The people you choose to surround yourself with, these are the people who influence you. And you start, whether you realize it or not, you start to build, take on those characteristics and you start to care about the same things that they care about, Right? And so that's what the problem of being a friend of the world is, is what's wrong with the world? The world is sinful. The world is corrupt. The world is, is in complete opposition to, to God. And when you choose to become a friend of the world, you're saying, I'm, you start to care about the things that the world cares about. You start um, building those characteristics of the world because that's who you're spending all your time with. That's who you're, that's this friendship that you have with that. And you can't, and that's the whole thing, this is how you become an enemy of God, is you can't claim to be a friend of God and a, and a follower of Christ if you love the things that he hates. Did y'all hear that? You can't be a friend of God if you love the things that he hates. That's how you become an enemy of God. And all of the things of the world are the things that are in complete opposition of him. And that's something that's so crazy is you have so many people in, the, in our world today. It's, it's like you can just say you're a Christian and then it's like, oh my gosh, this is magic. You're a Christian now. Like, and people say that they're Christians and yet they're still living as friends of the world. They're still, there's nothing different. There's nothing set apart about their lives except the fact that they come to church on Sunday morning. Maybe, if that's it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And so you, you say that you're a Christian, but you're still living exactly like the world. You're still living as a friend of the world. How can you live as, as, and calling yourself a Christian and claiming that title if you're still living in complete opposition to God? And he goes on to say, look at verse 5. As he's talking about how you become an enemy of God with this. He says, do you, or do you suppose it is not, as to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? And so this is where you see this, this adultery coming in. And this is where you see the word jealous. You can define jealous in a couple of different ways. One is you're jealous of what someone else has and you're angry about it. You're angry that they have something that you don't have and you want to take that from them. That's kind of defined in envy. But the kind of jealousy that can also, the way you also can define that is how it applies to relationships, right? So if you have a relationship with somebody, And the jealousy comes in when that person finds love and affection and attention from somebody who is not you. Does that make sense? And this is when we talk about God being a jealous God. It's because God does not want us finding love and affection and attention from anyone else except for him. Do you all agree with that? God does not want us finding love and affection and attention from anyone or anything else except for him. And so when we start pursuing the things of the world, that's why we start pursuing the things of the world is we're trying to fill up this emptiness that, we've, that we have. We think that the world can satisfy these desires that we have. And, and, we're, and we're going to the world to tell us how we need to live, how to make us feel better, how to make us happy or whatever. And we are leaving that relationship with God, becoming unfaithful in our relationship with him. And that's a problem. Because no one wants to be an enemy of God. When you live in complete opposition of God, that's, that's a dangerous place to be. So what's the solution? The selfishness that we have. It affects us personally. It affects our relationships with others, bringing conflict with others. And the selfishness ultimately puts us in a, in a, in a, as enemies of God. And so what's the solution? Look at verse 6. But he gives more grace... Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. And so here's the, the hope. The, there's a change of direction in the text here. So now there's some hope because it just sounds like a bunch of negatives. There's a lot of really depressing things going on. But now there's this, this hope, and this hope is through grace. Everyone say grace. Okay, so grace is defined as you receiving something that you don't deserve. Y'all with me? That's what grace is. It's you are receiving something you don't deserve and that's all that God is, is he is pouring out his grace on us, giving us things and blessing us when we absolutely do not deserve that, right? 
And so his grace steps in here, and this is something that I was reading in my study Bible as I was getting ready for this, is it says God's grace is able to overcome even the worst unfaithfulness. And so as unfaithful as we can become and as as far away from God as we can be, God's grace is more powerful than that and is able to change that unfaithfulness to faithfulness, right? That's, and that's the hope that's there. But this, this grace that God has, that he desires to give us, this is readily available to us. This grace is readily available to be applied to your life. But look at what he does here in this verse in 6. Verse 6. He quotes Proverbs 3.34, if you want to write that down. Proverbs 3.34 is what he quotes here by saying, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So there's, there's two groups he brings up here, but only one of those groups gets the grace. And which one of the groups is that? It's the humble because he's, it says he opposes the proud, and the proud is those who are filled with pride, who are selfish, who are, it's me, I'm on top of the world, I don't need God, I, it's all about me. And it says if you live as a proud person, if you're living out of pride, then you, God, it says God opposes the proud, but his grace is given to the humble. And this, hum, this humility, he goes on to express how to, to humble yourselves, and this humility is done through repentance. Everyone say Repentance. Okay, repentance by definition is you are changing directions, you are turning around. So you're going this way and repent, to repent means you're doing a complete 180, going the complete opposite direction. And so what James does here by quoting this verse is he gives this call to repentance. Look at what, how he, just, how he goes through repentance here. He talks about repentance through submission first in verse 7. He says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so this, this first act of repentance is, is talking about submission to God. When you submit yourself to God, you are submitting to his authority, which means he is in control. He's the one calling the shots, right? That's what it means to submit to authority, to someone's authority. Is there, You are no longer in control anymore. It's no longer about what you want because they are the one calling the shots now. I coach upward basketball uh, every year. It's, uh, I, I coach my nephew's team, and then I coach a fifth and sixth grade team. All right, And, and uh, last year, I took my fifth and sixth grade team to a championship. No big deal. But anyway, the whole thing about coaching is I need those players to submit to my authority. Because if they just go out there and, they, and they're all their own coach and they all try to do their own thing, it's chaos. Especially with first and second graders. They're just going to be kicking the ball around and running in circles and having no idea on earth what they're doing. And so I need them to submit to my authority. When they submit to my authority, who's calling the shots now? I am. So they do the drills that I ask them to do. They, they play the positions that I ask them to play. They run as many times as I tell them to run. They do the plays that I need them to, all this stuff. I'm the one calling the shots. It's not about them anymore. It's about, I need them to submit to my authority so that this team can be what it needs to be. But if someone doesn't submit to my authority, which is fun for me in fifth and sixth grade, is if you're not going to submit to my authority, you're not going to do what I'm asking you to do, guess what? You don't get to play. Simple as that, right? And so they get to miss out on this awesome opportunity to play basketball because they refuse to submit to my authority. And on, on top of that, they are now worse off because they didn't. Because they didn't feel like running because running's hard. I don't feel like running. I'm not going to run. Now they're going to be out of shape, so they can't keep up with the game. They're going to be completely unable to, to dribble the ball because they didn't take the drills seriously. And so now they're worse off because they didn't submit to my authority. And the call to repentance here is to submit to God's authority. Which means that if, you, if you're submitting to God's authority, that the other direction, what he talks about in the last part of verse 7, says you need to resist the devil. And so by submitting to God's authority, you are turning around from the authority and the influence of the world that's run by Satan. You are turning around so that you can now completely pursue Christ and, and submitting to his authority. By, and in turn, you are resisting that influence. Then he goes into talking about repentance through seeking. Look at verse 8. This is just the first part of verse 8 here. says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I love this verse. This is one of my favorite verses. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. But I feel like this is something that we, we neglect. And we think of, and just think, because here's the whole thing. At every, every moment of your life, every second of your life, you are either moving closer to God or further away from him. There is no in between. There's no just kind of floating in limbo here. You are every single moment of your life, you are either moving closer to God or further away from him. And the call here is to draw near to him. 
draw near to him. And, and how, do, how do we draw near to God? We draw near to him through worship. That's what we're doing right now. That's why we come to church. We don't come to church because God gave us a to-do list and you've got to check that off your list so that you can be a good Christian. You come to church because you want to draw near to God, because you want to seek him and worship him, right? That's what it's all about, and having fellowship with other believers. That's how we draw near to God. You draw near to God through prayer. That's something so many people just leave out of their relationships with God, which is, makes no sense to call it a relationship if you're not even going to talk to him, right? You draw near to God by communicating, by seeking him and, and seeking counsel from him through prayer. You draw near to God through studying his word. We like to put this up on a bookshelf because it looks nice and fancy as decoration, but we don't actually open it. And that's the call is to draw near to God by opening his word so that you can get to know him better so that you can know how to live a life that's going to bring him glory. Because he reveals that. That's how he speaks to us is through his word, and we just keep it closed. The call to draw near to God is applied to every single aspect of our lives. Everything that we say, everything that we think, everything that we do, all needs to be with this intention to draw near to God. And the only way you can draw near to God is, again, by changing directions. Because as long as you're pursuing the things of the world and you're living as a friend of the world, you are drawing further away from him. And the call in repentance is to draw near. And the only way you can draw near is by turning around. Okay? And what he goes on to say uh, through the last part of verse 8 and into verse 9 as he talks about repentance through brokenness. Look at the last part of verse 8 here. It says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded people. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And so we were, that got super depressing all of a sudden. Don't be happy, be sad, be miserable. And what is he talking about? This whole thing here is he's painting this picture of this attitude of, of repentance. This repentance happens because you are broken over your sin. This brokenness over your sin. Because that's the whole thing about repentance is you're not going to want to change directions if you don't first acknowledge you're going the wrong direction. Does that make sense? You're not going to want to change directions if you don't first acknowledge you're going the wrong way. I took a group of friends to see a movie probably a year ago. My favorite theater is the Galaxy Theater. I think Garland, maybe. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay, off of 635 around Jupiter, that area. Okay, so it's right off the highway, and that's like my favorite theater. And so I took my friends there, and because it's right off the highway, as we're leaving the theater, um, we're talking about the movie because we're all very movie critic people, okay? We think we are at least. And so we're talking about, we're picking apart this movie like, oh, I didn't like that. I didn't like this. And so we're talking about that, and, as, and I'm the one driving. And so the, the thing about leaving Galaxy is you have to leave a certain way because, I'm, and I left, this is right when I first started going there, is I'm thinking the highway is there and the theater. So all I have to do is just... Turn, get out and turn right, and then boom, I'm on the highway. I'm where I need to be. So I see a sign for 635. I know that's where I'm supposed to be. There's an arrow. So I follow it, and I'm thinking, like, yeah. And I'm convinced I'm going the right way. Like, I'm told there's not a single, there's not a second thought in my mind. I'm, I'm driving us home. And so we're, we're, drive, we're cruising in the left lane because I pass all you slow people who go, like, 50 and a 70 in the middle lanes. And so I'm in the left lane, and I'm just cruising. And we're about five minutes into the drive. And... Someone's in the car is like, Kyle, are you sure you're going the right way? I'm like, how dare you? What do you think of me? Like, I, do you know who you're talking to? Like, how would you, how, why would you question my job? I mean, of course I'm going the right way. All right, 635, highway, boom. I mean, I, of course I'm going the right way, okay? But as soon as I started saying that, I started to question, like, oh my gosh, am I going the right way? <laughs> and I, I start to realize that the things, the buildings that I'm seeing are not the buildings I saw when we were coming. And that's a, that's a warning sign, like, oh my gosh, I'm, we're going far away from home. Like, we're getting further and further and further away. And as soon as I realize I'm going the wrong direction, I'm like, oh my goodness, turn on the blinker, and I try to get over as quickly as I can and legally as I can to get off to get the first exit I can get to so I can turn us around and get us back to where we need to go. But I was not going to turn that car around until I recognized the fact that I'm going the wrong way. And this is this attitude of brokenness. This is where this comes in. And of why we should be broken over our sin. Because it's when you become broken over your sin, you are recognizing, I'm not going the way I need to be going. And And that brokenness also is a result of recognizing how you going the wrong direction is affecting your relationship with God. And that's where you become broken and devastated over your sin. The perfect example of that is in Psalm 51. Write this down. Psalm 51. 
read this. This is a perfect illustration of what it looks like to be broken over your sin. This comes from David after he sins with Bathsheba. And because dude, the home, the homeboy was convinced that he was, he was in the right by doing all the stuff he was doing, killing off the, 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 the thing that was causing problems, thinking I've got this all taken care of. And then God calls him out and says, you are that man through Nathan, the prophet. And, and then David, once he realizes, oh my goodness, what have I done? He is devastated over his sin. And this is the attitude that is necessary in repentance because you're not going to want to turn around if you don't acknowledge that you're going the wrong way. And this is what's necessary for us. And that leads us and that puts us by, by, humble, by, by becoming broken over our sin, we are putting ourselves to be in a position of, of humility. And that's where he ends in verse 10. This repentance through humility. This is our last verse. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. As you come broken, he talks about, you know, your laughter needs to go away. You need to be sorrowful. You need to cleanse your hands, purify your hearts. As you come in this broken state, you are lowering yourself as low as you can go. And by doing that, you are humbling yourself before God and putting yourself in a position to where he can exalt you. Because that's the whole thing. With pride and selfishness, as you are on the top, you are top priority. You're on top of everything. And as long as you think, as, and as long as you're up there, when you're at the very top, where's the only place you can go? If you're at the very top, where's the only place you can go? Everyone say it. It's down. There's nowhere else you can go because you're already at the top. And so that's what it means to be proud. That's what it means to be prideful and selfish is you're at the top. And the only place you can go at that point is down. But when you humble yourself before God, you lower yourself as low as you possibly can go. That's when they, then the only place you can go from there is up. And the one who is bringing you up is Christ. And he humble, as you humble yourself, he then exalts you. But this is something that goes completely against our world's teaching. is because it's all about you. I need to be number one. It's about what I want. It's about my desires. It's all about me. And so long as you stay in that place, you are not allowing God to be able to exalt you because you're already at the top. And so this call here, is to come before God as low as you can get, acknowledging the fact that that's where you belong. And that's where this brokenness over sin comes in, is you recognize that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. You are broken, you are useless, and that's the whole thing with pride, is you think you're important. But when you come before God broken over your sin, you recognize, God, I'm nothing. And I don't know why you love me, but you do. And I'm going to humble myself before you, God, and acknowledge the fact that this is where I belong. And that's something that's hard for us because we are prideful by nature. But that's the call today. And the only way you're going to humble yourself before God is by through this, this act of repentance, turning away from that selfishness and pursuing Christ. We're going to get ready for a last song here. And as we're doing that, just as we're thinking back on this, so we have this problem in our world. We have this problem in our life. And it's selfishness. It's pride. And this problem is affecting everything in our lives. It's affecting all of our relationships. It's affecting um, our, especially our relationship with God. And this selfishness is holding us back. And the solution to the problem is to not keep, because that's the whole thing. When I was driving the wrong way, if maybe I, I could have told myself, you know what, I think it will figure itself out. Some, I think once, if I keep driving, maybe there will be a magic turn and then I'll get to where I need to be. No, the only way I was going to get to where I needed to go is if I turn the car around. And this is the thing is, some of you in here, you've been Christians for a long time. You're like, Kyle, I've been a Christian longer than you've been alive. So I don't know what you're talking about. Like, I'm, I'm good with God. But this, this act of repentance is not a one-time deal of, I repent and I'm done. It's, this is a daily commitment to repent because it says in verse 1 that there's this war going on within us. This war of, of our selfishness and our sinfulness is at war in us every stinking day. So this call to repentance is, is every day. God, I, want to, I need to turn away from what's leading me away from you. Completely change my direction so that I'm pursuing you with all that I am. And the way that you get into that position of repentance is through humility, by acknowledging the fact that you need him. That's what humility is all about, is you acknowledge your need for him. And that's the call this morning. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? You're prideful and selfish by nature. But we need Jesus. We are in need of a Savior because we are sinful, we are selfish, And we are incapable of getting out of that situation on our own. 
And the only way to get out of this, this problem of sin is by humbling ourselves before the Lord. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do today because this is something that really hit me hard this week preparing for this. Because I'm, I'm telling you, man, I'm, I'm a very prideful person. I like to be in control. I like things being done my way. And if it's not done my way, I'm not very happy about it. And so this hit me hard because I just recognize how pri- proud I am, how prideful I am, and how selfish I am in that. And my, my, what I encourage you to do, my encouragement to you this morning is that you would come before the altar today and you would humble yourself. That you would get on your hands, and that's what the whole act of coming before the altar is, is an act of humility. Getting on your hands and knees and telling God, God, this is where I belong. I've been walking around with my chest up, my head up high, thinking that I'm on top of everything, but God, I belong right at your feet, on my knees and on my hands and knees before you. And I would ask that you would do that this morning. Maybe you've been living every, all your decisions in life are based on what you want to do. It's all about you. When you wake up, what do I want to do? What do I want to eat? What do I want to do? When it's all about you and, and the call today is would you humble yourself and would you repent? Would you turn away from this selfish way of thinking and draw near to God by submitting to his authority? You're not in control anymore. And maybe you made that decision before, but you have been, for the long time, you've been the the person on the throne of your heart is the person on the throne of your heart has been you and the call today and I'm asking you to be bold and to come forward this morning and on your hands and knees and submit to God's authority and say God you are in control and I just want to remind you of that by coming before you on my hands and knees right now I'm submitting my life and submitting to your authority maybe you have have been neglecting to draw near to him You've been distracted by other things. And honestly, this is probably the most you'll draw near to God this week is by coming into church. And you think that that's enough. I'm telling you, if this is the only time, this is the only amount of Jesus you're going to get, man, you are missing out on so much. And you are lacking because you are, and you're trying to find satisfaction and fulfillment and everything under the sun except for him. And the call today is, would you draw near to him? Would you make that commitment to draw near to him? God, I'm tired of being left empty and broken over these things that I'm pursuing because they can't satisfy me, but you can. Would you draw near to him and make that commitment, not to just draw near to him on a Sunday, on a Wednesday, but every moment of your life. Come before him and do that today. Maybe your pride has been causing division in the church. Maybe not, it's maybe not be as obvious as you may think. But maybe you've been in opposition with with what God's doing here because of your pride. The call today is to humble yourself and say, God, it's not about what I want. This church is not about what I want. This is about what you want for this church, what you want to do in my life. And God, I want to submit to that. I want to surrender to that. And get right with God this morning by coming forward and asking God to give you the right heart and and mindset. And, and, And the way you do that is by drawing near to him. Or maybe you're in opposition. Maybe there's someone in this room that you know you have a conflict with. Now we're getting really uncomfortable, right? Maybe you have a conflict with somebody in this room, someone sitting next to you. And as long as you're in conflict with them, that's affecting your worship. The call today is, would you let go of your pride, grab that person, ask for forgiveness, and say, man, I want to get right with you. I want to rebuild this relationship. I want, I'm, I'm sorry that I've been so selfish. Whatever it is, grab that person today. And I'm telling you, man, it is awkward, it is uncomfortable, but it is necessary. If you're real about following Christ and you want to be real and you want to humble yourself, that's how you do it. So I encourage you as we sing this last song, grab that person, come up here and pray with them. So we're going to get, as you stand to your feet, your heads bowed and your eyes closed still, we get ready for this last song. Maybe you're in here and you've, You've never submitted to God's authority before. You don't know what that means. You're you're living as an enemy of God. And you've been trying to find satisfaction and fulfillment in everything in the world. And you're tired of being left empty. The call today is, would you give your life to Christ? All you got to do is call out to him and submit to his authority. God, you're in control. It's not about me anymore because all I'm good for is causing a mess. I want to give you all that I am. 
God, consume every aspect of my life so that everything that comes out of me is worship and praise. Would you come forward this morning? So again, I challenge you. I'm asking you. I know it's weird to come forward in front of all these people and to to get on your hands and knees at at some steps, but I'm asking you to do it. To show God that, and, and physically showing God that you are humbling yourself before him. Would you do that this morning? Heavenly Father, God, we are absolutely undeserving of your love. And God, we all we're good for is, is selfishness, sinfulness. It's making a mess. And God, that's a problem and it's affecting everything in our lives. But Lord, I pray that you would give us boldness today to come forward and humble ourselves before you, God. I pray that you would show us God, may may you give us a brokenness over our sin this morning. God, lead us forward right now to come on our hands and knees before you, God, surrendering this sin that has been separating us from you. God, may we submit to you. God, may we commit to draw near to you. And as we draw near to you, God, laying aside our selfish desires, because I know that we, especially me, God, I think that I know what's best for me a lot of the times. I think I know what I want. I'm pretty convinced of it. But God, it's nothing, nothing compared to what you have in store for me, what you desire to do in my life. It doesn't even compare. And I pray, God, that you would, as Lord, that I would continue to draw near to you, God, that I wouldn't ever give up of that. Lord, but that I would constantly humble myself before you, God. May you encourage each of us to do that this morning. Surrendering all that we are to you. Because you are worth it. Because we... We are undeserving, but you are more. God, have your way in us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray.